These are all SNAs, so significant natural areas. So they're considered important. It's up to the, the landowner to interpret that and, and do what they think is appropriate to protect them. They don't necessarily need to do anything, but we're, we're really lucky here. The landowners here do appreciate it and increasingly appreciate it as we do this work. So yeah, we're seeing big differences. There's no reason we couldn't have Kiwi walking through these bush blocks and weka, etc. So yeah, as farmers start to realise that, then I think that'll happen. But it does come back to that maintenance thing. If, if pest control is too high maintenance, then it's uh, affecting the bottom line and it's the first thing they'll drop. So, so we need to find the methods to, to let them do it without it being a burden on the farm. Hi, I'm Jenny Goodright. I've lived in the area for uh, close on 45 years now with my husband, Sid. Uh, dairy farming and in the last four years we've got serious about trapping and baiting using e-traps that are amazing. Just really enjoying doing what I'm doing and getting the grandkids involved. It really got me started by Ralph. <laughs> by walking around in their bush. Um, and helping my nana. Three or four times a year you get the you go around and do the bait stations, don't you? Mark them off on your tablets. Yep, it's very cold and if there's anything left in them and what you're targeting. Yep, do some neighbours. Is he coming? Oh, could I go? William. Okay, it's the basic thing. Guys, it's an idea. Yep, we found it. We found it off the tree. Okay. Need to go back. Now I need to be with And it's moldy. Just a rat one. How do rats get in that? Quite easily. The very first bait station I put out, I bought from Marty One, and it was a cardboard box, and you under it each end and nail it to the tree, and then you went back a few months later to see to rebait it. And when I went back to the cardboard box, it had been eaten, it was gone. There was, no, there was nothing left. The staples are in the tree where this cardboard box had hung. And I thought, well, we're going to have to do something better about that. Hey. So then I started buying the odd bait station. And um, yeah, but Paul Anthony's got me on the GPS and you, and you know where they all are and you can, you know, um, and you know when your three months is up and it tells you that it's over 100 days and you've got to go and rebate. So there's my, my traps, so, so we're pretty much there. That, the birds are where he's done his bird monitoring, so we're on that one there. If I touch it, when I was here 28 days ago, I put 150 grams of bait in there, and there's not 150 grams left. There's very lucky if there's 50, and that's in 28 days. So yeah. Um, so when I come through next time, I'll put bait remaining, and if it's empty, you know, you just zoom down none. If there's a bit left and it's old, you put how much is left, and then you put in how much you've added. It's just keep track of it. Yeah, it's very really good. It's amazing. Yeah, I can do my 45 odd bait stations in oh, a good yeah, day, like but I'm pretty tired after it because there's some pretty steep country that I've got it in. So I tried to do it over two or three days now, and even sometimes William comes and helps, and especially down down on the swamp farm. Um, yeah, when it takes over, but, but you'd probably be looking at good seven to eight hours walking, jumping fences, you know, yeah. Um, I don't know whether I needed to put them quite in such hard places now, but yeah, it must be making a difference. Rats and possums are all over the place, so um, yeah, still happy to do the line every three months or three, four times a year. 
so you do an extra one to go in January and that's in the school holidays usually after school holidays so it's somewhere around then as long as we can get some bait this last couple of times been hardly any bait left most of it's been eaten but um, the bird life is just taken off two ease of drawing by something supposed to expose so our, our average two week count our five minute bird count is around about six two weeks these bush blocks and, and five years ago we first sat down in here and we were in a possum shooting competition and over two nights we took 50 possums out of this bush block and here and block down and now you, you could do the whole farm and not find a possum so yeah. big difference now we've had a lot of free bait it's not that inviting to go off and buy a bag of bait because you know you're, you're helping the environment and you think somebody should be helping us here we're doing all the hard work so it'd be nice to give them the bait to go and um, help with these pests that's that's part of the point in the, the cage system as well that we with those we can get rid of the possums quite easily yeah. and they're one of the big takers of bait so once once we get rid of that last possum then we're just down to rats and control when we're putting bait out for rats and maybe ease that off a little bit so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we get that down to three times a year bee traps because you don't have to go around i just couldn't possibly think about going around the farm every couple of days to check the, the traps they've got to be e traps so you can um, just get sent that email that it's it's triggered. Yeah, it's just amazing. It's quite exciting getting to the trap to see what it does, whether it's a, a rabbit or a, we've we've had the lot. We've had rabbits and cats, domestic cats, wild cats. Yeah, um, hedgehogs, ferrets, possums, rats. Um, a rabbit. I even had a quail one day. Um, they got let go. and get it even along the edge of a creek or something like that because animals will follow the waterline and they don't want to get their feet wet so then they'll cross over where they want to cross it so if we can actually put a trap we tried to do it quite some time ago and there just wasn't enough coverage to tell us when it went off but now we've got more gateways and all the end you know we're doing more techno man who's our man well, without that we'd um, lost and Nate's um, taken over doing some of the bottom farm traps for me. So yep, I don't have to go up and down through the farm every day when a trap goes off. It's, might make him a bit of a for school sometimes, but <laughs> yeah, it's quite fun, isn't it, Nate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very important job. It's a school that understands. Yeah. Nate caught a ferret two days ago. Okay. Right at the same. Two, three months ago. Okay. Yep. It used to be like a week, but probably not even two. Yeah, sometimes two three in a week. Um, especially over the summer months, you tend to uh, yeah, yeah, picks yeah. up. Spring, summer months, it'll pick up probably. Um, well, it'll be interesting this spring and summer because, like last spring and summer, that's why you took over those three traps. They were going off like you know three times or every couple of days, three times in a week. August last year was a big month, and then, okay. and then January, as soon as January 1st. Is, uh, what if we put it down to is the, when the baby's mum had sort of kicked out the last batch of babies, and then she's bred again, and then so they've got to take off on their own, and then that's when you're, if you're going to catch a whole heap more parents, they're out doing their own thing, they'll be juveniles, yeah, probably most of the last month, do you think it was a little juvenile, or do you think it was an adult another day? Adult. Wow, male or female? Check it out. Gotta check it out. No, put it on that record. Yeah, it's interesting to see whether it's male or a female. Does it stink anyway, don't it? Yeah. yeah. So, a lot of these lads, um, a lot of the parents, these guys support have gone off to a uh, university and they've been able to for testing for disease. Uh, so, if there's any technological breakthroughs that come, it's going to be due to you guys. So that you might. Cool. And how often are you checking the, the cage traps now? Oh gosh, Nate had one a couple of days ago, a ferret. Um, I've had a ferret and a possum in probably the last month and one one trap, particularly two rats. Um, they've gone 
very dry, really. It's almost like you're wondering whether they're still working, but they must be because they're still seed. Um, and they've still got bait in them, so yeah, just when you pass them, you just check them, make sure they've still got the bait and they're still seed. But, um, One of the crucial things is having LoRaWAN coverage. So LoRaWAN is an Internet of Things network. Uh, if you don't have a, a, a gateway and aerial near you, you'd need to get one of those put in. Across Franklin, we've got them everywhere, so it's fairly rare to find a spot where one of these things won't work. Um, but we can work with anybody to get one of those in. Um, and across the country, there's more and more gateways going in. So. Uh, so it's either a matter of purchasing one yourself or talking to us and we can let you know how to get that arranged. So good news Jenny, we, we do have reception here. Wow. Is there going to be Tate down here? Well, maybe one day. I don't know, it looks like the place where Tate would be. So that's um... Chicken lure, it's got, ma it's got mayonnaise and salmon oil. Not that one. It's chicken got, juice. Chicken juice. It's got um... Crazy. It's a secret recipe and you can't tell anybody this. Oh. It's a Mummy is videoing you. I haven't said yet. It's, um, it's best food mayonnaise and, um, and an oxo cube. A chicken, chicken oxo cube. Chicken stock. Same thing you have in your yep. soup. Gravy. Basically it's gravy. Could you eat it? If yes, it was... you could. If you want some, let me know. I'll scoop them up here. I want some. I'll put it on my chicken rice. <laughs> so, I can show you how it works. Every night at 9 o'clock, it's got a little timer in it. And whenever the timer goes off, it that twists around and it pushes that and it squeezes um, some of the lure out onto that pressure plate down there. Yes, it does. And we can, we can mimic it by putting a little magnet here. And it's going to come through there and then down and drop there onto that pressure plate. There we go. So every night it'll do that. You lift that door up there. And the way it works is that we're not expecting an animal to actually have something to eat there. All we want him to do is to come in and sniff it and stand on that. When he does, that's what happens. So the an animal will stay in here, safe and sound, um, through winter if you wanted to. You can put a cover over the top to keep the animal dry. Um, so you, if the neighbor's cat, it'll stay nice and dry in there. And then in the morning, everybody who's assigned to the cage will get a notification. They know that something One, two, can come out and let it out. Yeah. Your average animal is between 11 o'clock and sort of 4 in the morning. Yeah. Um, 3 o'clock seems to be a real common thing. Yeah, 2, 3, theme. it's quite often a ferret. If it's 8 o'clock, I must say at night in the winter, it's not likely to be a rat. Yeah, you know, but cat. hey, you never know, you never know. Yeah, they do surprise you. Bad. Yeah. Nearly every ferret has been sort of that 11 till, till 3 or 4 in the morning, but we occasionally get one at 4 in the afternoon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where did that come yeah, from? Yeah, I haven't. No, not at that point. And, uh, and wet weather. Stormy weather seems to bring the ferrets out. And we've seen that right across Franklin, all the people using them. And you wouldn't know that. If you had a kill trap, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't, wouldn't know what time. Yet. No. Exactly.
feel like it's uh, making a big difference uh, around the farm and hopefully helping eradicate TB with the possums and the parrots going. Maybe possums, yes, hedgehogs, they carry TB, that, that side of it. Um, I'm not sure where the ferrets and snakes do. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, ferrets. They do. Um, uh, because TB is a biggie. It's, it's huge. You know, if you've got TB in your herd, yeah, it's just about lockdown, and it's you know, it's worse than COVID. It's <laughs> yeah, you feel like yeah, yeah, all on your own. So I suppose yeah, the pest control does yeah come around to help. I haven't really put too much thought on that. I was looking more after the environment, the trees, and the forest and the floor and the fauna and everything but um, yeah no it's got to have its side that way. Mm. Ferrets are very interesting ones you've got. They're not considered uh, they're not considered to be a vector unless there's over six per square kilometre that's what they consider really high numbers and within a square kilometre here we've caught something like or 60 yeah. in 18 months. Yeah, yeah. And it's well and yeah. into the high numbers yeah. and the yeah. territory. So, so for TV, they're much more effective now than the yeah. yeah. But it's one thing in New Zealand, they are trying to eradicate TV. I don't know if they ever will. Because there's so many bush blocks that have still got so many possums and ferrets and things on that they pad it around. Huge dogs and so as we were talking before about what is success and maybe just getting rid of possums from the whole area and you know, getting that last possum, maybe that is success. And ferrets probably too. And ferrets, yeah. Ferrets yeah. 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 and possums are the worst, rats aren't nice. But... It's amazing. There's the duck life, the bird life. Um, there's even, um, Andy pointed out, and I've seen it, a, a glee, you know. Um, it's like a little duck and the babies sit on their backs and it's just so cool. But I've only ever seen one. I think he's seen one up at Wurubri Lake. Yeah, and there's a tree. The tree. So you've got your main lot of bush. See that tree over there? It's actually out in the paddock with oh, yeah. the brownish trunk. That's what Andy governs on how much growth it got. When we first started baiting, it, it was pretty stripped. There wasn't a lot of growth on it. It was probably going to get killed because the possums were eating the fresh growth so much. And now it's just, just getting bushier and bushier. Yeah, and these trees over here, the, the bearish ones, a lot of it's fenced off somewhere out in the paddock, but that's where the bats were. And of course they're nice and close to the water and they go down and get insects and stuff like that. So yeah, that's where he had the bat monitor. One thing I picked up with Tom that he thinks because we're getting rid of the rats, we have got more, mind you, they're feeding maize and things like that, but there's more sparrows and starlings and birds around, and perhaps the rats aren't eating those eggs. So we might actually have to look at, I don't know, having a bit of a barrel up on them because you don't want to end up with yes. too many sparrows and birds around. Yeah, it's a balance thing. It is a balance thing and, yeah. and the rats are obviously were eating the birds. So, yeah, we're, we're saving the, the tui and the kingfishers and the whatever. It's still, we, there used to be no birds, now there's... It does feel like nothing's happening but then if you remember back quite a few years ago there were none and now there's so many. Like it feels there's no change but then like over a long period of time there has been a real change. Well, what saddens me the most is I, I never saw a kakaka until I was 22 or so other than inside a zoo and now many times a year I can stick my head out and say hey there's a kaka and the boys just go yeah, so what dad? Three <laughs> Because they, they're wow. now used to it wow. and that's only in the last what three or four years yeah. that they're regularly wow. here. Um, yeah, kaka was a new thing for me. So. When I was feeding my lamb I had a kaka. Yeah there was one today, yeah we, we saw one. We're looking after the environment and all the native birds and animals are surviving. <laughs> doing so much better, you know, the trees are doing so much better. It's just growing tenfold, so yeah, I feel like we're doing a good job in our community. Kia ora, I'm Stu Muir, I'm in a place called Te Akaka, which is about 10 kilometres from the mouth of the mighty Waikato River. I'm a farmer, we're born and bred here, my kids are uh, actually sixth generation. This is my playground, this was once the main highway pre-1860 between the Monaco Harbour and the Waikato River. So many a walker used to come up and down here and it had got to a state that it was completely degraded and blocked 
by invasive pests, uh, willows and glyceria, but also from mammalian pests. Being brought up on the land obviously is brought up to be white baiting and duck shooting and, and eeling, all of those things that you, you do when you're a country kid. But as I was growing up I sort of saw more and more that we were getting less of those sorts of things. It wasn't the abundance that our ancestors used to talk about. So I thought what can I do to change this? And part of the process was to get in and clear this, open this up, but also when you're doing any sort of restoration work, if you don't include pests, um, you're not really fulfilling the, the entire role because what we want is to basically complete the biodiversity, bring back what was here in the first place and get rid of those invasive species that are destroying the beauty of uh, our rep or the, the swamp. So down here, we're probably like everywhere else, we have a variety of pests, Norwegian rats, your mustelids, your ferrets, your, your weasels and stoats, and of course possums. And all of those things combined meant that there was no regeneration of the ngahere. Whenever anything would seed, if it was lucky enough to get to that stage, it would be eaten. So probably 15 years ago we started um, going fairly hard out. We have put in rat bait stations, dock 200s, a variety of traps, sort of every 50 to 100 metres so that we could sort of focus on the different habitats but also the different behaviours of those animals. And it didn't take long actually, within probably within a year you start stopped getting as much um, bait being taken. I mean I've caught hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of stoats and ferrets. Now we mainly just get weasels. The possums are all but gone. I think my kids have only ever seen about half a dozen on the farm in um, their sort of 18 years of life, which is great because we used to go out it would be nothing to shoot 30 or 40 in a night. Now you just don't see them, it's, it's a rarity. Bird life has just thrived, you know, the kereru now live down here permanently, same with tui. Um, I can remember ringing up Doc one day and said, what the heck, there's not just tui down here occasionally, but they're actually staying here. And, and their comment was, well, what have you been doing? And when I explained the pest control, they said, well, they're no longer being harassed. They, they feel comfortable to live here. Um, another endemic species or endangered species is the bittern um, and we have many many bittern down here and by doing this you're sort of hopefully ensuring their survival because there are only 500 pairs left, estimated to be, um, and it's good to know that what we're doing is having a positive effect upon their life cycle. Pretty much every other native bird has just grown exponentially since we've been doing this. It's just basically all round good, I mean you can see Pretty much this age of Ngahiri returning all over the islands of the river. We've got 2,000 bait stations out and it's now a community led project uh, which is fantastic because people sort of um, they have a connection to the river and by getting rid of the pests it resonates with our way of life down here. You know people want to see and hear tuis and kereru and all of the wildlife that's down here. Insects as well, lizards, the whole works. We tend to concentrate on just what we see, but it's not until you actually pause and you, you realise all of the other things that make up the biodiversity, how important they are. And if you've got rats and you've got cats and you've got mustelids, those things never get a chance. That's kind of my greatest motivation. And you know, when you see something not working, you've got an obligation, um, really I think, and a responsibility to try and put it right, especially if you're a landowner. The actual physical clearing of the, of, of the river and the planting and the maintenance, yeah, that took a lot of work. But once you've got your pest numbers down, probably half a dozen times a year you've got to redo your bait stations. And it's like now when, when, when the willows aren't out, when everything's hungry, you know, and then hit them again just when the birds are starting to nest. Conversely, you know, in the autumn um, is a good time and then obviously in winter when everything's hungry. So once you've got it, like now I can go around the majority of my bait stations and the bait's untouched, you know, which is a great feeling. You miss the traps, that's a, you know, that actually needs a lot more work, you know, so I try and, well, because I'm on the farm, I, I'm seeing them all of the time, but in these more isolated places it's a bit harder, so maybe once a month I can go around. Um, but as the community get more involved in it, you know, they start to take up some of that slack, so it's it's not as hard as people think it's it's basically following a pattern um, of the seasons and we do that anyway don't we you know with our planting and our, our veggie gardens and harvesting our fruits so if you follow the seasons 
it's fairly easy. Mud my tucker. As a farmer, like everyone, we work, you know, long hours and hard all, all weather. But, you know, you might be having one of those sort of grumpy, horrible days. And, you know, you see a killer do come and do that massive swoop or you, you hear the twoies, you know, and you just pause for a moment. And, you know, it's, uh, it actually does make you feel, feel really good. It's, um, it shows that what you're doing is actually having a wider benefit than just what your business is. And, and, and then also when you take people, you know, I think we take our land and that uh, river a bit for granted because we're living it. But when you get visitors and, 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 and kids and that come through and they haven't seen that sort of thing before and you see their sense of wonderment and joy, that, that's, yeah, that, that um, is really heartening. I love it. I think for landowners, it's, and people generally, we can think that the problem is so huge that we can't make a difference, but you know, we can. I mean, if you look at, say, as, as a farmer, thistles, well, you get on top of that, well, pests are no different, it's just another pest. And you can just tie it into part of your regime, you know, if you've got a bush block, it's when you're in that paddock, check the trap. And what I've found is that the more people that get into it, it actually becomes quite addictive and it's quite, we are quite competitive as people, so it's like, how many ferrets have you got? Or, you know, did you, you know, salt start on your place? Or, you know, how many cattle do you? And, and I think farmers, by and large, we love the land and, and that environment. We wouldn't do it otherwise, <laughs> you know, it's too hard. But um, I think most farmers, they just need to start and, and, and there's a lot of support out there in community groups. And once you start, it becomes very addictive and you won't stop. Also, great to get the kids. It's a good job for your kids. You know, if, if they're on that bloody device, I'll give you, you know, whatever you want. Go and check the traps, or, or my kids, I make them make up all the bags for the bait stations, you know, and, and, and they earn their money through that. You know, they don't get pocket money if they don't work, so it's another job that they can get out, and what better place to go and do a job than walking along a boardwalk or paddling down the river or just going for a walk through the bush, you know? Um, yeah, there's many different ways of, of attacking it, but use your cutting and you'll get there. Okay, so here we have, never go anywhere without your mistlers. So this is your ferret. If you think alphabetically is how it goes. So ferret's the biggest, nastiest. They had to, it's a cross between a ferret and a polecat. That's why growing up we always called them polecats. They took eight times to successfully bring these buggers into the country. So that's your biggest one. Then you get the stoat. This is the real nasty, cunning, 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 hard one to catch. But you know the difference with that is because it's got a black tip on its tail and quite a long tail. And they're straight along the underbelly. And a, a ferret and a stoat run like that. Whereas a weasel is just straight. They've got a more um, wiggly pattern underneath and a short tail without the a real black tip and they're just nasty 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 little beggars and then of course your rat i mean look at that it's just any fantail any bird for any of these animals it's gone they all live down here so yeah they just but what we've tend to do initially we massive um, amounts of ferrets and stoats and then we seem to not get so many, they'll come through in waves occasionally, you know, in March and, and, and that time of the year. But it's the weasels, I don't know, I don't think we're getting a secondary kill, or they just are more prolific. But these, these can be just about ready to pup, and they will, if the food gets scarce, scarce sorry, they'll hold on to those pups until the food becomes abundant again. And before they leave the nest, every female will be pregnant. They're just literally killing machines. And they're designed to kill and then store. They do, they're a bit like humans, they kill for fun. You know, you get one of these in the chicken coop, they'll kill every chicken, not because they're gonna eat them all. Just once they start, they can't stop. So, you know, if you see one on the road, don't swerve. Or if you swerve many times, but make sure you get it, don't swerve. So they're just, they're, they're killing machines. They're designed for the Northern Hemisphere where the, where the, the rest of the birds and things, mammals are, are used to them, but down here, our, pred our birds, they've got no defence, so hopefully we'll come up with another solution of getting rid of them, but for the meantime, that's something you can do in your own backyard, and that's the beauty of Predator Free 2050, is that we can all do our bit, whether it's big or small, 
your bit will actually make a difference in the end. So I use um, a combination of traps. The hardest thing is getting your first one. Once you get the first one, if you squirt some of its bloody juice around it, it just attracts, attracts more and more. So it's getting that first kill and that first smell in there, I think is really key. And I either use um, reconstituted little bunny rabbit, little bugs bunny there, and, and they're good and you just put them on the nail so the insects don't eat them. Or there are these other lures, fish smelling lures, they last a bit longer but I'm not 100%, they probably are good but I don't know. And then stoats love mayonnaise and egg. Um, some people will use eggs in them, that's all fine. These traps just work um, like that, so you've got to have them somewhere where you can check them all the time. Um, and then obviously you've got to dispatch them. These ones obviously you don't have to check very often. One we also use, pretty much where we put a possum bait station, we'll put a rat one to. And the idea being, as we know, rats tend to grab bait and take them away and, and store them. But if you put them in here, there's a little um, wires in there and they can't take them away. Plus it stops the possum stealing it all. So what I try and do is have everything in one spot. Um, either 50 metres or 100 metres. On the river, obviously, you're getting in and out of a boat, so we sort of cheat. It's more like 100 metres or 90 metres, wherever somebody's my my is. Um, the other thing that we do because obviously we don't like handling poison, but with these pellets, if you put them in little bags, and then it's just a matter of slipping them in. You don't have to break open the bag, the possum will do that. And that way you're not having to handle. Job done, easy as. And that's a key, I think, if you're wanting to get other people involved in it, is to make it simple. Um, these are quite good. Some people swear by them, other people don't like them. Um, again, a lot of it's uh, the placement, you know, there's no point putting it where, where they don't use. And if you watch a ferret or stove working, they like little tracks. They like running alongside a stream or along the edge of a track in the, in the bush. Also, you'll quite often see on, a, on trees, you know, where the possums make their marks. So sort of target those areas or, or target um, if you've seen karaka berries or your terrari berries being eaten by rats and things like that, well, you know, that's the place to put your traps. Um, it's basic knowledge, huh? it's just like observe the world around you and, and get onto it and, and you'll get rid of them. But, so that's, that's how we do it, combination, because not one thing is, is going to be right, but a combination of them you increase your opportunity. The other stuff we'll do <coughs> If you've got people, like, especially with their duck shooters or people with dogs, so in March, April, we'll use this so there's no secondary kill. Uh, but we tend to use Profiticum because when this rat has been poisoned by that, there's enough poison in there that the stoat and the ferret will get a lethal dose because they'll go straight to the juicy bits of the liver and the kidney. So you're getting, you know, a double kill um, by using that type of bait. But obviously um, there is a secondary kill, so you've got to be aware of these people with dogs. There's huge opportunity to get people that aren't landowners, and in fact that's probably one of your, your greatest opportunities is, um, you know, like here we've got duck shooters and white baiters, so it's in their vested interest to get rid of the pests. So as soon as we put it out amongst that community, you know, they jumped on board boots and all. Um, and in fact they're controlling a lot of the islands now. I don't have to do it all. Um, and there's so many people that want to do something, don't know how to go about it, and if you reach out, you know, through social media or your rugby club or whatever avenue you've got, you'll be surprised at how many people are willing to come in and give a hand. There's a lot of goodwill, and that whole Predator 2050, it's captured the imagination of so many people, and it's something I'm heartened about, you know, wherever you go in the country, you find little groups that are doing these amazing things. Um, you know, it may just be in the backyard, it might be in the local reserve or, or what have you, but if you reach out to people, people are only more than happy to be part of something that's bigger than themselves.